Now, tonight, I'm going to tackle the one called Mormonism, or the Mormons. I've told you before, I deliberately don't announce beforehand which of them I'm going to take, for obvious reasons. Um, and if uh, you have a particular one that you're interested in, just keep on coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sooner or later, the right one will come out. If there is one that is particularly troubling you just now, or about which you have a real concern, let me know and I'll try and take that fairly early. We can't take them all. Um, I want to take spiritualism, for example, fairly soon because I've realized that quite a number have contacts with this indirectly and are wondering about it. But if there's one that you really are urgently needing help over, let me know and I'll take it fairly soon. Now then, the Mormons. I'm quite sure you'll have heard of the Mormons. You may not know their full title, which is the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter Day Saints. That's the full title. But most people call them the Mormons, and they don't object to that title. Some of you will have heard them over the radio. If you're musically inclined, I'm sure you've heard of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, the 375 singers, I think, in it, and one of the best choirs in the world. And you can buy their records at the, ba the Pilgrim Bookshop, I notice, uh, up the road here. They have more people in the American equivalent of who's who than any other religion in America. They've got a lot of influential people in them. I suppose some of you going to Gatwick Airport on, or further south have seen the Mormon temple that's recently been built there, have you? Standing in the middle of the field, a magnificent building. You won't get inside it because you're not a Mormon, but it's a magnificent building with a huge spire stuck in the middle of a field. They've recently built a temple in New Zealand and they've built another in Los Angeles. There are now two and a half million Mormons and they're increasing very rapidly. Two million of those have joined them in the last 25 years. So that gives you some idea. They have something like 15,000 missionaries active. And that's why sooner or later you will come across them. But that's no mean figure. And one of the reasons why they have so many is this, and I've often wondered whether we shouldn't copy this. It's a great idea. Almost all their young men spend two years full-time on missionary work before they start their career, after they finish college, before they earn their living, they spend two years going anywhere in the world to spread the Mormon faith, invariably supported by their parents, if their parents can't afford it by the church. But with 15,000 active, young, unmarried missionaries traveling around, you can guess that they get around. Incidentally, you, you'll usually find them in twos, and this is one of the difficulties of talking to them, because one of their techniques is quite simple that if you begin to get one embarrassed, he passes the authority, in their phrase, to the other, who then changes the conversation to another topic. And this kind of ping-pong is not easy to cope with. And if you'll take my advice, never speak to two of them at once. Speak to one and say to the other, now this is the chap I'm having a conversation with. But there they go out in twos, 15,000 of them all over the world. Most of them are in America, in the states of Utah, Idaho, Arizona, and Southern California. And it's been described as the most American of all cults. I suppose that most of you know that the man who really started it all off is a man called Joseph Smith. And if you are a fan of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, as I am, uh, I'm sure you've read at least one novel of his about the early Mormon trek across the uh, great Midwest plains of America to Salt Lake City. More of that in a moment. Well now, let's look at how it all started. Once again, it comes from over the Atlantic, and we've got to start with a man called Joseph Smith, Jr. In America, they seem very fond of having the same name as father, and uh, you have... Uh, Joseph Smith, Jr., born of Joseph Smith, Sr., and Lucy. He was born in 1805, beginning of the 19th century, and his father and mother shed a great deal of light on this unusual boy. His father 
was what we call a mystic. He had visions, he had uh, mm -hmm. trances, he had dreams. And above all, his father was a treasure digger. He had a craze for digging up buried treasure. And in fact, uh, he had a theory that Captain Kidd's treasure was buried near their home. And you can still see the remains of the craters dug by Joseph Smith Sr. around the home. I mention this because this was the atmosphere in which Joe, as everybody called him, was brought up. An atmosphere of digging for treasure. And his father spent all his life digging holes around the countryside looking for buried treasure. His father also was a counterfeit coiner at one stage and produced some very passable replicas of American dollars until he came in contact with the local constabulary. Now, Lucy, his mother, is also interesting from this point of view. Uh, here we are. Oh, we'll have to get two more seats out. Lucy, his mother, dabbled in the occult quite a bit. And one of the things that strikes me very much about this whole story is this, that when you dabble in the occult, it is not only you that is likely to be affected, but your children and your grandchildren. I've noticed this again and again and again, that where people dabble in the occult and with spirits and other things, that the influence goes down through the generations, and it's a very dangerous thing to handle. She was also a clairvoyant. Now, Joe Smith inherited this interest in such bizarre things as digging for treasure and uh, telling fortunes and using peak stones and other things. He was also quite an adventurous lad with the fair sex, like his father before him. And he was described in his early days as a young man who was noted for his untruthfulness, exaggeration and vicious habits. That's quite a charge. Now, in 1820, when he was 15 years of age, he claimed that God the Father and God the Son appeared to him in a wood and appeared in physical form as two human beings with bodies. And that they told Joe that they both wrote off the existing church and that he was to be the one to start the true church, to replace all the ones that had gone too far wrong. In 1823, three years later, he claims that an angel stood by his bed and that the angel, whose name was Moroni, claimed to be the son of another called Mormon, which is where the name comes from. And this angel gave him a message three times that he was to dig for something hidden. Not until 1827 did he find what the angels had told him to look for. And in 1827, on a hill near Palmyra, New York, he claims to have unearthed some gold plates which he called the Book of Mormon. And it's that book that is the heart of their faith. Now, with the plates, which Joe Smith said were in hieroglyphics, and he said they were in reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics, a form of writing known to no other scholar, or I should say no scholar, um, and he claimed that he had also been given by the angels some huge miraculous spectacles, one lens of which was called the Arim and the other the Thummim. But by looking through one of these, they were too big to put on, by looking through one lens, he was able to translate the reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics into English. Now, if you think this, <laughs> you just wait, there's more to come. Um, the tragedy is that two and a half million people can accept this. That's the tragedy. And it says something for our fallen human nature that we can fall for such things. Anyway, let's go on. Between 1827 and 1829, he was translating these, and his secretary was a man called Oliver Cowdery. The secretary, however, never saw the gold plates. Three other people said they did, 
but later left the Mormon movement and uh, we can form our own conclusions. In 1829, on May the 15th, Peter, James and John sent John the Baptist from heaven to confer the Aaronic priesthood on Joseph Smith and his secretary Oliver Cowdery, who now became priests after the order of Aaron in the Old Testament. Joe then baptized Oliver and Oliver baptized Joe. And in 1830 they published the Book of Mormon or the English translation of it. And in that year, 1830, they organized the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints and almost immediately persuaded others to accept this book and to set off to teach it to the Red Indians. They became very unpopular at home because it was all regarded as a complete sham and a hoax and so they moved to Kirtland, Ohio. Here, because they were not known, more people accepted, and in six years they had 1,600 converts. They then bought 63 acres of holy ground, which they said would be the site of the New Jerusalem in Ohio. From 1831 to 1844, Joe Smith had 135 revelations, as he called them, of various truths. He also started a community called Novu, N-A-U-V-O-O, -O, Novu, a great city which was to be a Mormon city. And it was at this time that he started what the Mormons have been most well known for, or are infamous for, namely polygamy. He justified it with one of these revelations and said it was all right in God's sight for one man to have more than one wife. For this he was arrested and charged with a number of things, including fraud, sheltering known criminals and one or two other things. But in 1844, while he was in jail, a mob of 200 were so angry at what was happening to the girls in the place that they broke jail and murdered Joe Smith at the age of 38 and a half. And so the dreamer became a martyr before his 40th birthday. There is now a monument 38 feet 6 inches high of him in Ohio, symbolizing the age at which he was killed. Now after the assassination of Joe Smith, the leadership passed to another. In fact his followers divided, a few faithful ones. Uh, chose Joseph Smith's son and became known as the reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints but that's very small you won't meet them over here but the major group were led by a man called Brigham Young and this is the great romantic figure of Mormon history and if you read Conan Doyle's stories you'll know the name of Brigham Young well now he was 43 years old when Joe was martyred or assassinated and he announced that Novo would be abandoned that they would have to leave there and go somewhere else and now began a brutal trek of 20,000 people right across the states of America to Salt Lake City hundreds died of disease and exposure and starvation 20,000 people set off and a few thousand reached the place 1300 miles away and when they got there, Brigham Young said, this is the place. It was a barren, desolate place that nobody else would inhabit, and a great salt lake with bitter water, and they settled there. <coughs> Soon afterwards, a locust plague came on the crops they had planted, and so they prayed very hard that uh, the locusts would go, and a huge flock of seagulls came and ate up all the locusts which Brigham Young took to be the sign of divine approval of all that they had done. He was the president, he was the law, a courageous and a ruthless man, and by 1857 there were 76,000 people living there. In 1890, by the way, they had to end the practice of polygamy to become one of the United States. And the other states would only accept the state of Utah, which was the Mormon state, on condition 
that they cancelled the law of polygamy and ever since they have not done so. Brigham Young died in 1877 leaving 400,000 pounds, 17 wives and 56 children. The leadership now is in the hand of a 93 year old man called David Mackay and he has been leading them for many many years. Just uh, an idea of how large they are, there are, as I've said, two and a half million Mormons now. There are altogether um, 6,000 congregations. <coughs> I've told you they've got 15,000 missionaries, they have 2,000 schools, 15 hospitals. All the men are priests. Either, now I'm wondering if I've got this right, either Aaronic priests or Melchizedekian priests. I work that out, but if you know your Old Testament, you know what he's talking about. One is the higher order of priests, one is the lower, but all men are priests. And as I've told you, all young people uh, are called to be missionaries. One reason why they are growing is that the birth rate among Mormons is a, about 36 per thousand. Whereas in the rest of America, the average is below 25. And they do have a higher birth rate than the average. And when you consider the average includes uh, Roman Catholics, this is quite a, a high birth rate. And there's no doubt that part of their growth is due to this very high birth rate. The other reason is, of course, this tremendous mission zeal. Now then, having given you a rough history, now we've got to look at the most important thing, the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and of course, one problem is that nobody's ever seen it. Because Joseph Smith tells us that he was told by the angels to rebury it. And uh, then he said he didn't know where he reburied it and couldn't find it again. So that these gold plates on which these things were found have never been seen. And uh, again, you can draw your own conclusions. But the Mormons who visited me recently left me with this little booklet, You Can Be Happier. And uh, I'm sure that's true, but um, <laughs> <laughs> on the back you'll see a kind of gold plate with the hieroglyphics worked into them, which is at least a facsimile, or not a facsimile, but a picture of the belief. And of course, when you read this, you begin to find fairly early on that it is the Book of Mormon that is the heart of the faith. <coughs> I'll come later to explain why it is that they don't always tell you all this when they meet you first. But let me tell you first of all about the Book of Mormon. Straight away, let us say that to them, the Book of Mormon is as much the Word of God as the Bible. And in fact, there are three books by Joseph Smith, which to them are counted as the Bible. The second is Pearl of Great Price, which is Joseph Smith's testimony. And the third is Doctrine and Covenants. And these three books contain the revelations given to Joseph Smith <coughs> and Brigham Young. Now then, what about this Book of Mormon? What does it say and what's it all about? Well, it's about certain events which happened in the past, or it claims to be, and certain things which are to happen in the future. And this is where uh, we really come into some extraordinary things. As far as the past goes, the Book of Mormon claims to give us the history of two ancient civilizations on the American continent, which are called the Jaredites and the Nephites. Shades of Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites and Perizzites, you know all the others from Canaan. Now the Jaredites left the Tower of Babel 2,250 years before Christ. But the Tower of Babel was not where you think it was, it was in America, according to the Book of Mormon. In other words, we had it first. 
<laughs> the Jaredites left the Tower of Babel in America, crossed the Atlantic into Europe, and then returned back again to Central America. They left the Tower of Babel in North America, went to Europe, came back to Central America, where they became corrupt and were utterly destroyed. So that's the end of the Jaredites, but it's all there. Now, it's the Nephites who are the interesting ones. These are supposed to be righteous Jews who left Jerusalem about 600 B.C. The Nephites. So that would be uh, before the fall of Jerusalem, before the time of Isaiah. And they crossed the Pacific Ocean to Peru. And one of their prophets named Mormon kept their records. Now, these divided, did the Nephites, into the Nephites proper and a second group called the Lamanites. And the Lamanites are the Red Indians, according to the Book of Mormon. And they were cursed because of their evil deeds with a darker skin. Now come some even more extraordinary things. After his resurrection, Christ visited America and preached the gospel to the Nephites, instituted baptism, communion, and the priesthood and other mystic elements. Unfortunately, the Lamanites then killed off these Nephites at the hill where the golden plates were buried. And so various plates were buried in the hill where the Nephites made their last stand against the Lamanites. So of all the people in the Book of Mormon, the only ones left are the Lamanites or the Red Indians who were responsible for killing off the Nephites, who had the golden plates and who were visited by the risen Christ after his resur resurrection. This then is the history of God's dealings with men in the West. And I think you can see that what is happening is this. Here are the continents. Here's North America, South America. Here's Europe, Asia, Africa. Now the Bible, of course, is all concerned with that little area of the world. The meeting point of those three continents. And it's quite clear that, or it's, it seems clear to me, that Joseph Smith and others had a deep feeling that it was a bit unfair to have America left out of all this. And that there seems to be some kind of deep feeling here that uh, if God so loved the world, he ought at least to have done something over here. And it seems to me out of that desire has arisen all this business of the Tower of Babel being over here and these Nephites going backwards and forwards and, and all the rest of it. And the Jews coming from Jerusalem here. It puts America on the map much earlier than Christopher <coughs> Columbus. Now, they refer to the Book of Mormon as the sealed book of Isaiah 29, and these people as the other sheep which are not of this fold, mentioned by jo uh, Jesus in John 10. Now then, what does the Book of Mormon say about the future? Once again, America is not going to be left out. The Red Indians will all be converted, or rather the Indians of North America, Central and South. The Jews will be restored to their land, and the New Jerusalem will be built in Jackson County, Missouri. And the ten lost tribes will come from the polar regions to the New Jerusalem in Missouri. Where they are at the moment or what they are doing is not stated. Now then, this is the kind of extraordinary history we get in the Book of Mormon, or at least in Joseph Smith's translation. I underline again, nobody's ever seen this thing except Joseph Smith. And uh, he translated these reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics into that kind of history. Now then, the second book, The Pearl of Great Price, we don't need to... Uh, talk about that much. Um, in the book, he claims that Professor Anthon of New York certified his translation, said that the original hieroglyphics were Reformed Egyptian, and a mixture of Assyrian and Arabic characters. Professor Anthon said publicly that he had never said any such thing, and indeed, 
he said that when he read what Joseph Smith had written, he found it all to be perfectly false. That's his phrase, which is quite a phrase. But he said it's a perfectly false translation, and uh, as a linguist, he just couldn't support it. The other book, Doctrine and Covenants. Now then, are these books true? That, of course, is the basic thing. Are they true? Well, there are certain ways of finding out. Archaeology is one way. <coughs> Digging up the past. And the simple fact is that the huge culture and civilization described in the Book of Mormon as being uh, in America long before Christ has left not a single trace <coughs> anywhere. They've discovered all kinds of other cities, but not a trace of this. There is no trace of Egyptian or Hebrew writing in America. There is no trace of iron, steel, brass, gold and silver coins, swords, armor and chariots, which the Book of Mormon says there is. No trace of cattle, sheep, swine, horses and asses till after Columbus took them. And of course, if there had been those animals before, archaeology would have found them. Anthropology is another science to check up on this. And anthropology tells us that the Red Indians come from the Asian Mongoloids and are nothing whatever to do with the Mediterranean races. And so that again uh, just rules it out. The science of graphology, the study of writing, is another science that could tell us something. And in fact, there is no such writing as Reformed Egyptian. And those hieroglyphics are just not comparable to any known writing. What is significant is that there are 25,000 words in the Book of Mormon borrowed verbatim from the King James Authorised Version. Furthermore, there are some incredible anachronisms. 2,000 years before Christ, he's talking about glass windows, steel boats and compasses to navigate by. This is utterly ludicrous. It's an utter anachronism. Furthermore, there are some prophecies that England would join in the American Civil War, that Nova would never be destroyed and so on, which have not come true. There are also many terribly simple mistakes. In the Book of Mormon, Jesus is born in Jerusalem and the Jews are happily eating pork and a number of other things that uh, just don't fit. Now, where are these plates? Joe said he was given them by the angel Moroni but he was not allowed to show them to anyone else. Three witnesses swore an affidavit that they had seen it, but all later recanted. Well then, where did this book come from? There are three possible answers. Joe said it came from God, or from the angels. From God through the angels. Well, you can either accept that or you can uh, look for another explanation. I'm afraid I just could not believe that a, such a book could come from a God of truth or integrity. A second possibility is that it came from Joe Smith, out of the fertile imagination of a boy who had that kind of background. And there's a lot to be said for this. But there's a third possibility, and that is that it came from evil spirits. And I think there's a lot to be said for this too. Remember that his mother had dabbled. Remember it was there in the background. And remember that lying spirits can so mix up the human mind that people will fall for anything. And in a sense the whole thing is just so ludicrous that I can't believe a human being was capable of it. One feels that it's just on the principle that Hitler used, that if you tell something fantastic enough, a lie that is incredible enough, people will believe it. That it's got to be so incredible before they'll believe it. Well, I, I'm afraid, take the latter view, because I think it's done such damage. Which brings me to a very important point. What do the Mormons believe? Let's look at their beliefs. And it's at this point that we come up against a difficulty. When you first meet a Mormon, he will not show you the Book of Mormon, he'll take you to the Bible. And furthermore, he will say that he believes Orthodox Christian beliefs. 
And a bit like the Freemasons in this, not until you are committed and into it will the other things be told you openly. It's one of the reasons you're not allowed into a temple until you are committed, because things go on inside a temple that would raise questions if you knew about them beforehand. And this is one of the problems. For example, the first article of faith in their creed is this, we believe in God, the eternal Father, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Now what's wrong with that? Nothing. Until you ask, what do you mean by God? And what do you mean by Jesus Christ? And what do you mean by the Holy Ghost? Now you see, one of the most difficult things today is this. The devil is using Christian words with another meaning. I find this in so many discussions I have, even with ministers. You can't just say the right words and assume that you're all agreed on them. You've got to say, what do you mean by this word? And so we say to the Mormon, what do you mean by God? And here's the extraordinary thing. And these things would not be told you at the beginning. God was once a man. That's the first thing. And his name was Adam. And he lived in the Garden of Eden with a celestial wife. And Adam became God. Furthermore, he's not the only God. There's another one called Jehovah. And there's another one called Elohim. Now we know perfectly well those are both names for the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible. But the Mormons say no, there are two names. And in fact, though they say at the beginning, we believe in God, when you begin to press them, they believe in God's <clears throat> more than one God. And this is a huge difference from us. So big as to be a different religion. Uh, let me give you a famous saying of Joseph Smith. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. In other words, Adam was a man who became God. So can you. And we are all on our way to becoming gods. Now this is something you may never have heard before and it takes an awful lot of swallowing. Furthermore, God has a body. He is not a spirit, he has a body. He was once a man who had a body and here he is with a body. And so the Bible must be taken quite literally when it talks of the hand of God, the eyes of God, the mouth of God, the feet of God. He has a body. Now, we know perfectly well, or I assume that when you hear about the eyes of God, you don't think God has a body, but that he can see you. And the Mormons have never got round the fact that God has, according to the Old Testament, if we take it as they take it, that God has feathers and wings. Because God will shelter us under his wings, says the psalmist. Now, if you take the eyes and the ears and everything else literally, you'd have to take the feathers literally. And a feathered man is, to say the least, an unusual kind of body. <laughs> but it is this excessive kind of extraordinary li uh, literalism that leads them into this kind of difficulty. So God, the Adam God, the main one, was a man with a body, and he still is. But he's now a God-man. And as he was a man who became God, so are we. And we are on our way to becoming gods. And therefore, when the Mormon begins by saying to you, we believe in God, the Eternal Father, you have to know what you're on about to ask them about this before you get any further. Otherwise, you could think that you were talking about the same thing. Let's say, what do you mean by Jesus Christ? Well, he is not the same God. He's another one. He's another God. Another man become God. And he was born of physical intercourse between the Adam God and Mary. He was not born of the Holy Ghost. He was born between God the Adam God, the Father, and Mary the Mother, both of whom have physical bodies. And so Jesus was a result of sexual intercourse between the Adam God and, and Mary. Now this again is a, a real departure from what we believe. They believe, too, that Jesus is a descendant of Bathsheba, 
thus approving David's polygamy, and that Christ, when he was pre-existent, was the brother to the devil. That Jesus, during his lifetime, was married to Martha, Mary, and Mary Magdalene. And so saw his seed before he was crucified. When we ask, what do you mean by saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit? They don't mean a person. The Adam God, the Father, has a body, Jesus has a body, but the Holy Spirit hasn't. And so it is a fluid. And the word it is very significant here. There's an intriguing letter in the Baptist Times this week, in, all about the Holy Spirit. I don't know if any of you have read it, in which the, the, the writer consistently talks about it all the way through, which is very interesting. What do they believe about men? Well, all men are pre-existent spirits. You existed before you were born. We all have the spirit of Christ. We are all on our way to becoming gods. What do they believe about salvation? Well, here is one of the subtle things. We are saved by the blood of Christ after and these, these are the key phrases, after all we can do. Now that turns the whole thing upside down. And therefore, no Mormon has any assurance of salvation. No Mormon can tell you, I have eternal life, because he's never sure about this. Do you see the problem? How can I know I've got eternal life? How can I know I'm going to heaven? How can I know I've been forgiven? You can't if it's after all we can do, because nobody can be sure they've done all that they can. And that throws it back very much on works. The church, there is only one true church, the, the Mormons. The future, there are three layers in heaven. Let me just tell you where you're going to be. Um, three layers in heaven. Um, the top layer, is for those of you who sufficiently love your wives to have married them for eternity as well as time. You can have two kinds of marriage among the Mormons. You can either go to a church and be married till death us do part, or if you feel more sure than that, you can go to a temple and be married for heaven. So uh, some couples go on to the second marriage. Um, others don't. <laughs> and uh, some couples, in spite of Jesus saying in heaven they neither marry nor are given in marriage, you can have a celestial marriage in a temple. You'd have to go to Gethwick for this. And then you can live with your spouse forever. And the celestial marriages will certainly be in the top layer of heaven together with all the gods. You can repeat your courting days when you're set together up in the gods. Right, now there's <laughs> number one. The second layer is for other Christians and men of goodwill. So that puts the Baptist family here. Um, and the third is for the heathens who've never heard anything about the Bible at all. But it's all heaven. And of course that means hell doesn't exist. There is no future division this way. Now when we turn from their beliefs to their behaviors, we find the most astonishing thing. This will puzzle you. When you look at their behavior, they're jolly good. <laughs> they really are. They're consistently well behaved. They have a very good social conscience. They are thrifty, zealous, amiable, hospitable, friendly, helpful. They don't practice polygamy today. They are outstanding in their work. They're very good workers. And American firms that have branches in Salt Lake City will tell you that though they have a much smaller proportion of their labor force in Salt Lake City, they have a higher output, much higher than their other branches. So they're very good workers. In fact, a lazy Mormon can be sent to a psychiatrist at the church's expense. <laughs> There's a thought for you. <laughs> it's an intriguing provision. Their leisure is quite remarkably organized. They believe the church should organize leisure thoroughly. And so they spend four to five nights a week at the church. 
and the church organizes everything sports, hobbies, drama, music, homemaking for young couples, dances, concerts, everything. And everything begins and ends with a hymn and a prayer. So you just have a, if, if a youngster joins the Mormons, they'll never be worried as to what to do at nights anymore. They, they can go night after night after night. And it's a very fine program and a very healthy one. As far as giving goes, they all tithe. That's a law. You've got to tithe to be a Mormon. As far as fasting goes, they fast for two meals every Sunday and they give the money to the poor. Every Sunday, two meals, they do without. That's something we might well copy. And they abstain from alcohol, from tobacco, from tea, from coffee, and from Coca-Cola. <laughs> All of which have mild drugs, of course. Tea having tannin, coffee caffeine, and Coca-Cola a very mild shot of cocaine. And this is uh, the principle on which they work. So they abstain from all those drinks. By the way, the alternative in instant postum is a magnificent drink. drink. Have any of you had it? Yes, I love it. <laughs> you, yes, you, you have to go to Boots for it in this country as if you're... Or else Crank's health shop. <laughs> right. Um, they are very law-abiding. They have little or no juvenile delinquency. There's no juvenile delinquency in Salt Lake City because of this leisure organization, which is intriguing. Uh, they have a devoted family life. Their crime rate is far below the national average. When it comes to welfare, listen to this. They have a hundred bishop's warehouses. And here are stored food, clothing, medicine and money. Something like three and a half million pounds a year is spent. And a hundred thousand people are helped. If a Mormon is out of work, they get complete groceries, clothes for the children, everything from one of the warehouses. All the time they're out of work. They are engaged in politics, they're engaged in business, newspapers, banks, insurance. As far as education goes, the largest church controlled university in America is the Brigham Young University. So that here is an extraordinary thing, the most extraordinary. Their behavior, now that they've got rid of polygamy, their behavior is almost all you could wish. It's remarkably good and owes a lot to the influence of early American Puritanism in their views of work and so on. But as far as behavior goes, they really are quite outstanding people with well above average morality. So that you get this funny combination of most peculiar beliefs and remarkably good behavior. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, but I was reading this week the story of a new spiritualist movement in Latin America that's growing rapidly. And you know, they have the most awful black magic and spiritist <coughs> beliefs and, and ritual. And yet, they have apparently a more Christian behavior than pretty well any other Christian body. Now, if you want to know how subtle the devil can get and how deceitful he can be, this will tell you. Because we live in a day when, alas, everybody is judging people by this. And this is how the devil is going to get us in this generation. Because he'll say it's the behavior that matters, it's if anybody's kind to the poor and if they go about doing good, that's the real Christian. And quite frankly, if that's your judge of what real Christianity will be, you'll become a spiritualist if you lived in Latin America. Because this is how they behave. The real question you see is this. What is the truth? What is the truth? You cannot judge truth, unfortunately, by a man's behavior. The devil can even counterfeit Christianity in behavior that way. Well, the answer is you can only judge truth by what God has said, by the Bible. I've tried to um, give you a quick picture of the Mormons. Let me now tell you some of the things that I think I've learned from studying them. The first thing I've learned, as I've mentioned already, is this. Don't dabble in the occult. When you do, you can not only do damage to yourself, you can lead hundreds, thousands, millions off the truth. 
And the one thing the devil wants is to get you away from the truth. <coughs> and he will use any method he can. And I think to have a sect that has peculiar beliefs and outstanding a good behavior is about one of the most subtle things he has yet tried. Because if they behaved in as peculiar a way as their beliefs would indicate, you wouldn't even be interested. Secondly, what is it in the truth that the devil hates? Well, as I've studied all these sects, I've come to one or two conclusions. <coughs> most of these cults deny hell, most of them. And I've noticed that again and again, this is a common feature, the devil hates that truth because it's the one thing that could make people turn to Christ. And so you find again and again in these cults the denial of this and an asser assertion that everybody will be saved sooner or later. The devil hates that doctrine of hell. And it, from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, he said, you shall not surely die. And he's still trying to say it. And I notice that he's managed to get all the Mormons off that. The next thing I notice is this. The devil hates the belief that we're saved by faith alone. He hates this. Because it can give someone an assurance of eternal life now. And he is always trying to add good deeds to this. Always trying to do it. And when you boil down so many of the cults will find it in the Jehovah's Witnesses, will find it elsewhere. They always add a bit of this. And therefore it makes you less sure of your faith, of your standing before God. Because even if you do believe, are you sure you've got enough of this? It explains a great deal of the zeal that we come across in the cults. Because if you're not sure, you will naturally try to do more and more. And I think you'll find the devil loves to add works to faith. Now I'm not saying that good works don't matter. What I'm saying is that salvation depends on faith alone. If it's real salvation, it will show itself in good works. But it doesn't depend on the good works. It depends on Christ and his, his merits, not ours. So that I detect in Mormonism and in one or two other sects a very subtle way of getting us off certain fundamental truths and doing it in a very convincing manner. My last word must be, what do you do when you have Mormons come to you? Well, the first thing is talk to one of them and only one. The second is have your Bible with you and use it. And say, you believe in the Bible? So do I. Let's look at it together. And don't look at anything else. And take them through the Bible. And if they quote it, say, now where are you quoting that from? Open the page and read the whole passage in which that text occurs. And discuss it with them. Realize that you are up against someone who has not taken away from the Bible but added something to it and that's very difficult to cope with. Because in a sense they regard you as inferior and having only half the word of God and that makes it very difficult. And you're up against someone who's not sure of his salvation. Give them a simple testimony of yours and say, I am sure of Jesus, I'm not sure of myself but I'm sure of him. And I'm sure he is able to keep what I've committed again to him against that day. Simple testimony. Not putting your confidence in yourself, but putting it all in Christ and saying, I'm sure of eternal life now. I've begun to live it now. It will go on into heaven, but I've got it now in him. A simple loving testimony based on the Bible and based on Christ can go a long way. I have found this. With the Mormons, with the JWs, with all these others, most of their converts in England are among people who sincerely want to be Christians, but who have never been in a church that had solid Bible study. That's what I find. And so they will come and again and again, somebody has said to me, these are the Jehovah's Witnesses, were the first people that made me open my Bible. And that's what convinced them it must be Christian. And I found this, that in a church where people are studying the Bible and getting real Bible teaching, these cults can't make any headway at all. Even if you haven't the knowledge to answer them, you get the instinctive feeling of the Spirit, there's something wrong here. There's something unusual. 
Well, morality and good living never saved a man yet. And however good living the Mormons are, we must tell them sooner or later, it is not your good living that puts you right. It is Christ and his blood alone that can save a man. That is the heart of our gospel.